right here. So to thank you all for coming um, today, we're gonna talk about uh, slow cooker meals. So really glad you're here and we're going to hopefully teach you something if you don't know, um, if, you, if you don't know anything. Um, and then also if you uh, are an expert on slow cookers too. And so feel free, we'll get going here, but my name is Andrea Nikolai. So I work with the University of Florida in the extension in Polk County here. And so um, anything with food and nutrition, I'm your person here in Polk County. So I'm a registered dietitian also. And um, yeah, so I try to use all everything I know just to help you guys how I can. And so just any mention of um, trade names or any brands or anything, they're just for educational purposes only. And I just wanted to let you guys know that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, today here's the webinar info. If you haven't been on one before, you can kind of see the screen and if you hover down at the bottom or the top, um, you can usually see a set of controls that come up and then there'll be a chat option. So if you have questions or comments and you'd like to put something in the chat box, feel free. Um, and you can also have them go to everybody or just to me if you would like. Okay, and then I'll send an evaluation following the webinar with some recipes and stuff and just I really appreciate your feedback it helps us a lot so I guess it helps me know what I can teach you know better or where I'm missing um, points and stuff like that but also then I guess you know so if you could come to another class you would hopefully see an even improvement so get started here do you um, do you sometimes feel this is true about eating healthy like you can live to be 100 if you give up all the things that make you want to live to be 100. Um, or would you prefer healthy eating to be more like this? Your body is not a temple, it's an amusement park. Enjoy the ride. So imagine this, you've just walked in the door and you're greeted by the aroma of a luscious soup simmering on your stoves, in your slow cooker. You slice a loaf of whole wheat bread and toss a simple salad. And dinner is served. And so while the joys of roast ribs of beef, filet mignons, and T-bone steaks are undeniable, the soul women appeal of a beef stew is eternal. So uh, Julia Child said that. So just um, get you going here. Here are some of the benefits for using a slow cooker. So if you're just not really sure, you know, what the point is with these. You know, there's a lot of different appliances out there now. Here are some of the great benefits. So a slow cooker uses less electricity than the oven. So that is a definite plus. And then slow cookers can be used throughout the entire year. So I know we have people from all over the country listening today. And you know, just um, in the Northern state, you might want, you know, grilling might not be the most fun thing in the winter, but this is one appliance, you know, you can just use all year round. And they provide a welcoming aroma of hot food during the winter. I don't know if you guys have ever walked in your door and you have um, greeted with that, but it's a great smell. You're like, what is cooking? Um, and then in the summer, slow cookers don't heat up the house like an oven does. And that in Florida is a huge advantage, at least I've found. Um, and so just, yeah, it's a really good benefit. And slow cookers also um, help tenderize then, um, help tenderize less expensive cuts of meat. So, you know, a crock pot, you know, can save you a lot of money that way. Just you can save the more expensive cuts like round steak or sirloin, um, cuts like that. And then for like the grill and the stove top, and then you can use the less expensive cuts here. And then I don't know if any of you guys listened to the sheet pan meals webinar I did or anything like that, but one of the appeals of slow cookers is they usually allow one step preparation and cleanup. So, you know, you don't have all those dishes, which is really great. You know, it's everything is in that one pot. And then I really find this interesting, but a variety of foods can be cooked in the slow cooker. You know, you automatically think uh, chili or like a um, pot roast, I guess, you know, or something like that, or beef stew. But there are a ton of things, you know, anything I've done, mac and cheese, you can do lava cakes, lasagna is very common. And so that's kind of fun, you know, just things that might take a long time and you could just put them in there and not have to worry about them. 
And so also then, you know, learning how to cook, trying new recipes, learning from your mistakes, and just having fun. Like that's part of the point of this too. So I just, I have to share, you know, um, I have a colleague and his idea or using a slow cooker is um, Dumpin' Ron. So his name is Ron. So it's Dumpin' Ron. And so what he does is, you know, he puts all, all these different things in his slow cooker and um, it just turns out really good. You know, using um, beans are one of his go-tos. So he'll make different kinds of beans all the time, you know, trying different spices. Sometimes he'll put an adobe, adobe and pepper in there um, and then just trying, I guess, different things, but they always seem to taste great. So it's kind of, don't be intimidated by it. And somebody else told me to, you know, so she was kind of, you know, there's different things that are the best of the best scenarios, which I'll teach you um, if you don't uh, know those already. But she was just saying, you know, she was experimenting and just trying, you know, salsa, taco seasoning, broth, chicken, vegetables on top, you know, using pre-cut ones. And she just throws it all in there and lets it go, you know, different stuff. Um, she was using it nightly, but it just, she's like, it always tastes good to me. And so just, you know, maybe that's one of the things, you know, the marinating of the flavors, but just, you know, don't be intimidated by it and have fun. So you can know your slow cooker and that can help um, give you a bunch of advantages. So, you know, read your instructions. I know everybody still has those and just make sure to get those out then and <laughs> follow the directions, right? And so most slow cookers have two out of three settings. So we got, um, we have the low setting, so foods will cook in about six to 10 hours on the low setting. And then on the high setting, foods cook for about four to six. So the high setting doesn't quite cook it, cut it in half, but it's almost. And so um, just it can be, I guess, really nice to know those things. And I have read just as I was researching even more for the presentation that the slow cookers now, they cook hotter than um, they used to, so, all right, so I'll just do that here, okay, so then, and then if possible, just if you can try to put it on your, on the high setting for the first hour, and then turn it to the low setting, if you'd like to use the low, um, just because for food safety, you know, um, it's, where the danger zone is 40 degrees to 140 degrees, right? So 40 degrees is, you know, just um, a little bit, you know, it's coming out of the fridge. And so then the 140 is, um, I guess, I looked, I looked it up because I was kind of curious, what is the temperature of 140? It's kind of like you know, if you were to put your hand in the water, you would burn yourself, you know, but it's not boiling. And so just you're safe cooking it on low um, the entire time, but you just want to get out of that danger zone if you're home, you know, as fast as you can. So if you can crank it up to high and then turn it down, um, that would be the best for just food safety. And so the first time you use your slow cooker, just recommendation is um, stay at home just to make sure it's working properly. Um, who knows, you know, it, you'd want to know if your slow cooker started talking to you, you never know. So slow cooker safety now. So just making sure to wash your hands before, during, and after food preparation, because you just want to always do that whenever you're cooking, just make sure you're safe um, and keep bacteria away from your food. And then you want to start with a clean slow cooker, utensils, and work surface, which makes sense. And then thawing meat in the poultry in the refrigerator before cooking in a slow cooker. And so some people might be tempted to just, you know, they have frozen chicken breasts, um, and that's the thing about the slow cooker is it's not recommended. And so you don't want to cook frozen meat or poultry in the slow cooker. So a slow cooker, you know, it takes uh, several hours to reach a high enough temperature to destroy bacteria. And that's how it works is, you know, it, it goes up there and it cooks for a long time. And that's how it destroys all that bacteria. But, you know, if it's frozen, it's going to take a really long time to get out of that danger zone. And so the bacteria start multiplying rapidly with those temperatures. And so that's the uh, same reason why, you know, if you have groceries in your car, just, you know, it's between that danger zone and you want to get out of there as soon as you can. Okay. And then, you know, you don't have to cut up the meat, but if you do cut it up, make sure you cut it up in uniform pieces so that you can ensure thorough cooking. And then plus you want all your dish to be done at the same time. So, you know, just because you can, um, 
cook something for a really, really long time doesn't mean you necessarily should. And so the little piece of meat, you know, and then a big piece, you know, they're going to be done at different times and you'd want them all to be delicious. So just um, checking your instruction booklet then on big cuts of meat. So sometimes, you know, <laughs> try to stuff like, you know, your Thanksgiving turkey in there, but just make sure that it's um, the right uh, like size for your slow cooker because there are different sizes so you can get a bigger one or you can get a smaller one but just um, knowing how big is um, you know maybe too big for your slow cooker and so just you know if it's too large um, that's your you know trying to pound that turkey in there you know it's not gonna cook quickly enough to avoid the bacteria growth so just trying to do it that way and then like I said they're available different sizes so you can, instructions will vary. And um, you can also just, you know, when in doubt, you know, cut the meat up into smaller chunks and then add that liquid such as broth or water barbecue sauce suggested, and then keep the lid on during cooking. So we'll talk a little bit more about those things. And then if you cut up meats and vegetables ahead of time, you know, you'll see this in another, in a recipe that we talk about, but just store them separately in the fridge. And, um, you know, I was thinking to myself um, or trying to think of, you know, what you would say and you would say maybe, well, I'm going to cook it all anyway together. So why does it matter? But, you know, if you cut up the meat and the vegetables in advance, you want them. Or it helps because the slow cooker can take several hours, you know, to get to that bacteria killing temperature. So you don't want that um, bacteria to already start you know, migrating into those vegetables and getting a head start on you even before you start cooking. So might as well go that route. Okay, and then um, placing vegetables in the slow cooker, um, you wanna do those first so because they cook slower than the meat, surprisingly. And so you put the vegetables in there first and then meat on top. And you know, if you screw this up, it's still gonna turn out okay. Um, and then you would top it with a liquid or broth, water, or a sauce. And we'll talk about this, but you don't necessarily need to use liquid, but it just helps with uh, um, cooking it, I guess, helping it cook better. So, you know, just um, another note is that the meats will, are like the meat on top would help flavor those vegetables underneath it as it cooks. So make it even more delicious there. Okay, and then just for easy cleanup, definitely want to spray the slow cooker. That was, um, I used to help out in a soup kitchen just a really, a lot. And, you know, just, it was like, you definitely spray that slow cooker because if, you know, try to talk in the dishwasher later, there's definitely can get to be a rim if you forget. Um, and a pretty hardy one sometimes. And you can also use these uh, slow cooker liners and they're made for the heat of the slow cooker. And so I looked this up, um, just, you know, it is plastic greater, you know, it look, appears to be plastic. So they're actually made, made of nylon resin. And then, so they're made like the crock pot ones anyway, there's crock pot liners they're called. And they're um, made in like, so they're made with this to ensure safe cooking at any temperature setting when you're using your crock pot or slow cooker. So that's the crock pot ones and they're also BPA free. So you'll know that. Um, and safe up to 400 degrees. So that's kind of nice to know. And then other sites, you know, I've found just when I was researching, you know, cooking on like high, low, warm, you know, they're the Reynolds, they said, you know, they're good. Um, they've been using them for over 30 years and um, compliant with the FDA and things like that. Um, I did find, I was trying to find, you know, any, <laughs> any drawbacks at all. And, you know, it's it just, I did find that if it's exposed to high temperatures for a really long period of time, you know, like some of the uh, pot liner like ingredients may migrate into the food. And, but the FDA, you know, they even tested that and determined that based on current data, the amount of chemical migration poses no health risk. So, yeah, so just in summary, I would say little or no risk um, of these, but, I guess who knows, you know, in another 30 years, we might know. So um, just they could be a great thing to help with cleanup. So that's a lot you wanted to know about bags. All right, so recommended temperatures. So whenever you're cooking meat, it's recommended that you check that temperature. 
not only does it help make it sure it's cooked to a safe temperature to kill the bacteria, but it also helps you know when um, you, you, you know, it's done cooking. Um, it helps you make sure, it helps um, so you don't overcook things too, right? Because sometimes you're just like, well, I better make sure it's done. You know, it's kind of pink a little bit. So I guess I'll put it in there longer. And, you know, maybe you could have taken out the chicken, you know, or meat earlier. Maybe it was done and it would have had, um, it'd be uh, more moist and tender for you. Okay, so then here's just another tip too. So filling the slow cooker no less than one half full and no more than two thirds full. Okay, so you're, so you're thinking I'm getting a little picky now, but um, there are advantages to that too. So if it could, if it's too high, right, you know, it's the same thing as trying to stuff a big bird in there. So food um, may cook too slowly to be safe. And then if it's less than half full, it's a good idea. You know, it's, you run the risk of burning it basically. And you know, so you could do it, um, um, but it would just, it's really unlikely, I guess, that it would, or increases your likelihood that it would burn by the end of the cooking time, um, especially if the liquids cook down too much. Um, so that's if you fill it less than half full. So, you know, you can try to figure out, you know, about how many people you have in your family or when you might use a slow cooker and then try to buy the size based on that. Because Maybe you only need like a mini slow cooker or have a couple different ones. Um, and then, you know, on the two fold to the crock pot, you know, they need a little room above them so that they, you know, simmer slowly instead of just um, sitting there steaming. And so that'll make sure they're safe. So here's just um, how they kind of work and that'll help you figure out the food safety. So it's like they work through the direct heat from the pot because the pot gets, you know, hot in that inside. And then that lengthy cooking time too. So that amount of time at that temperature destroys the bacteria, which is great. And then there's steam that's created within that tightly covered container there. And so that's, um, that's how it cooks. And so that is why you wanna keep the lid on and keep the lid closed during the cooking process to prevent the heat loss and to keep the food safe. So I don't know about you, but if you've ever been to like a work, um, potluck or something like that where people bring stuff everyone wants to look in everybody else's dish but if it's like you know it's fine if it's um, really close to at the end of the cooking time but if you're at a you know thing and people are you know just plugging it in and you're kind of peeking in there um, you could just really the time it takes just you know it takes a lot longer for it to cook you really want to keep that lid on unless you're like really close to the end of the recipe or that recipe tells you to add other ingredients. And so, um, you know, it's helping it cook. So I just remember my mom would just, um, the look we would get, you know, if we just uh, lifted up that slow cooker lid um, when beans were cooking or something, you know, you just, you, you don't do that. Um, <laughs> so learn pretty quick, you know, after the first or second time. Um, so if you're not home during the slow cooking process, so this can be good um, here in the north, like tornadoes, you know, the power could go off, ice storm, right? And then in the south, we have to worry about um, things like hurricanes or things like that. But if the power goes out and you're cooking, you know, and it's not done, you know, um, you can, what you can do is you can finish cooking it by some other means. So, you know, if you have a grill, you know, or uh, some other way to cook where you don't need electricity, definitely just finish cooking it and then you're good. And then if it was completely cooked before the outage, you know, it should remain safe, you know, up to two hours in that slow cooker. Okay. All right. And so just to review then, and if you guys, I see you're putting some things in the chat box, so I'll make sure to look at those um, at the end when I can. Um, but just what ingredients should you place first in the slow cooker? So um, you guys want to type in the uh, chat box. All right. So I'm getting vegetables, vegetables. Oh yeah, <laughs> Nicole puts number two. That's a, that's a quick way to write it. Um, yeah, thank you guys, definitely vegetables. And so um, thank you for listening. <laughs> they're, they're like, we already knew that. Okay, so which statement is true? So what about here? You always saw the meat or poultry before putting in the slow cooker. You should fill a slow cooker between one fourth and three fourths full. And then if the power goes out, the food in the slow cooker will be safe several hours if you leave the lid on. 
yes, you guys are all right. So always thaw meat or poultry before putting it in the slow cooker. So good job, you guys. And so here, um, some of the, like, the best parts, right, are just um, some ideas. So the first one I just, I have for you would be the pot roast, right? It's simple and delicious. And in America, we aren't eating enough vegetables. And it's a great opportunity, you know, to add more um, in your slow cooker. So just um, trying to do that, you know, doubling them on the bottom can be great. And you know, something um, that comes from that meat there um, would be just um, if you put a little water in there or something, or just the juices that cook down after, the juices that cook down um, on top of those vegetables and um, some people call them pot liquor, right? And that can be excellent broth um, starter for something like a vegetable soup or something like that. So if you can save that broth and then skim the fat off the top, you can use that in, in all different ways, but some people, um, that, that could be considered gold. All right, so then you might wonder, well, okay, so the slow cooker, there are some better cuts for the slow cooker. And so, you know, um, for the beef, you could see some on the left and pork and um, chicken, almost all the cuts work for chicken. So beef, um, you know, I was looking at them and we really want lean cuts of meat when we can, right? So you look for less marbling on the meat. So that's that white part that's on the meat. You want less of that then. Um, and then I, I did find on, on the Beef Council website, chuck tender roast and chuck eye roast. You know, they're only 150 calories for those two per three ounces. So that's a serving of meat. Um, and they work really well for slow cooking. So that would be less than other things. And then pork tenderloin would be your leanest on that right side there. Okay, and so then just cooking your own chicken, um, here's how a couple of different ways you can do it. So you can cover it with water, right? And then cook it on high for three to four hours. And you know, it depends on the size and you want it to reach an internal temperature of 165. So that's how you know, okay? And so then um, you can just put the chicken in there, um, but you could flavor the broth, you know, by adding if you have an onion or celery or carrots, things like that. Um, you could add those below that chicken then, and it'll help flavor that water. And so you'll also have really good broth there, um, it, which is delicious. And you can buy your own broth, but this would be cheaper and it can have, you know, just, um, yeah, less salt, I guess, and just a lot of flavor. So go with that one. And so roasting chicken, you can also do that in the soaker. So you season the outside of the chicken, right? So you can slather it up with seasonings or whatever you would like. You can do sage, you can do thyme, you can do some garlic and onion powder. So just massage it all in there um, and maybe smoked paprika, just thinking. And then um, what a colleague does, you know, she mentioned she just puts it in a plastic bag that it refrigerates, for, refrigerates it. Then it has time with all those seasonings just to kind of, you know, uh, relax in there or maybe overnight, and then in the morning, she'll just take it out of that bag, um, and then, you know, put it in the spray slow cooker, and then cook on low for 48 hours, um, and then when she gets home, then she has this roasted chicken, and so, you know, a couple of, um, you know, I was reading different ways of doing roasted chicken, and um, so this is without water, right, um, and you can also put um, like a ring of foil at the bottom and use it as a rack to keep the chicken um, from sitting steaming in its own juices. So, you know, chicken will actually make some juice itself. Um, so if you elevate it with like a, maybe a foil or something like that, or some people use if they have a crock pot like trivet or rack, um, you can use that and then you um, can do that. And then there's another option then too is when you um, take it out, if it's not brown enough on the top for you, you can stick it on a, a pan and then broil it in the oven for three to four minutes. And the crock pot, um, the liners are usually oven and microwave safe, but you could check with your uh, crock pot just to make sure. But for broiling, you would want to take it out of that because it's not safe for that oven. So then it's ready to serve, but you don't have to do that either and it'll be delicious. Okay. So then um, just talking about this too, and this recipe is in your handout, but it's one of those kind of dump and run ones, right? Um, so you just put chicken breast in there and then you add those other ingredients right on top. 
you know, if you don't have frozen corn, you can just use canned corn. Um, you can use canned beans and then um, some cumin or something like that, season it how you want, and you can end up with some great um, chicken tacos. And you can use that in different ways too, you know, just trying to think about leftovers, trying to use up the food that you have in your fridge to prevent food waste. So you might have chicken leftover, chicken tacos one night and chicken noodle soup another night and chicken salad another night, you know, if you don't put all those ingredients in there. Um, but I guess while well, you could still do that with all the ingredients, just have an interesting chicken salad, right? Okay, and so then prepping the night before. So here's just a recipe for lentil vegetable soup, right? And so lentils are awesome. You don't have to pre-soak them. They're really, really good for you and they're more easily digestible than other beans. So if you're kind of like wary of beans a little bit, these could be um, your go-to. They help have fiber, a ton of it that helps you feel full and just really great. So what you can do then, is you can prep this the night before, kind of cutting up those vegetables. You can buy pre-cut vegetables. Um, and then just if you do add meat to this one, you'd want to keep it separate, remember, and then just kind of dumping it all in the, in the morning and then running with it be delicious. So just some casseroles and soups, you can do those too. You know, I always, like I've mentioned chili a few times, but you can do vegetable lasagna, jambalaya, like a breakfast casserole, bean soups, tomato or potato soup, and then I'm talking about my chili, right? So um, feel free to write in your, the chat box there what are some of your favorites. I'd love to hear. I don't know if you can also hear um, we have a lot more outside, so I apologize about that. And I just, um, oh yeah, chicken stew is a good one. She said, okay, oh, okay. Denise is talking about that. All right, so just um, with the vegetable lasagna, I just wanted to say quick, if you had any questions on that, I have a colleague, right? So I'll just quick describe a recipe for you. She takes, um, she uses it in the summer, right? takes of what is it ever is available in her garden. So she uses like those zucchinis or summer squash um, and could use mushrooms. And then she sautes all this, adds a jar of tomato sauce and then about a half jar of water. So she's putting that all in a pan and sauteing that. And then um, she takes the crock pot and starts layering. So she puts the sauce vegetable layer in first that she just sauteed, you know, with the tomato sauce. And then she puts the lasagna noodles she just uses those whole wheat noodles and then just some cheese, some spinach, and some sauce vegetable mixture again and just layers it and she just has fun with it. And you know, you don't have to use those pre-cooked noodles either. I looked at a number of recipes and most of them don't use the pre-cooked noodles and don't cook the noodles prior to putting them in there. So it's a um, really simple way of doing it. And then um, she finds that hers is done in about three hours. Um, and then by the fourth hour, you know, the noodles are starting to get a little mushy, she says. So she actually uses this one on like a Saturday morning. And so then she's ready, you know, has her family meal at lunch that day. Um, and then you could also use something like eggplant, you know, instead of those noodles too for a lower carb option or zucchini. Um, just, yeah, so you can put meat on it, things like that. And I wanted to mention too, when we were talking about the different meat options, you can do ground beef in your slow cooker. So if you are, we're curious about that, you can. Just recommended with, I think it's um, every pound of ground beef, use like a half cup or a cup of water, um, just to kind of give it some steaming sauteing. And then um, also you could use something just to give it liquid like salsa instead of the water, right? Um, things like that. So, you know, we're talking about liquids, um, things like that, but, you can, you know, just put a, you know, cut of meat on there and top it with vegetables without any liquid, but won't cook as well at, at, because, like with at least just a little bit of liquid added. So even, you know, some crushed tomatoes with the juice or even barbecue sauce, that counts as liquid, right? You, just a little bit can help it um, cook that meat. Um, and then just, you can overcook things too in the slow cooker. So eventually the meat will dry out. Um, with the, the, all the heat, okay? So, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, the longer it'll just get more tender, but there's a point eventually <laughs> where it'll kind of start to um, toughen up a little bit. 
So here's um, just a couple more recipes, but just an eggplant pasta sauce. So, you know, eggplant, they're gonna be coming, you know, into season here. And it's really great, you know, this one only takes about four hours to cook too. So it's maybe not ideal when you're gone all day, but um, the advantage is it would be ready for you more quickly. And this one's in your handout, and then you can pair it with some whole wheat pasta for that extra fiber, It'd be a really good one. All right, and then spaghetti squash too. That is also an excellent one to do with this. And there's some recipes I'm gonna send you. So you just take that spaghetti squash and you poke some holes in it and you put it in the slow cooker with a little bit of water and you cook it on low. So then when you come home, it's ready. And so I don't know if anybody has not tried uh, spaghetti squash, but it is excellent. It's very low calorie um, and it's really good for you with that vitamin A. So um, could be a great, uh, it's great with tomato sauce on it, a little sprinkle of cheese is the way I like it. Um, okay. So then dessert ideas too, just um, you could do any of those, right? Baked apples, lava cakes, homemade applesauce, mixed berry, compote. Um, and so here's just a baked apples idea, right? Um, you take the apples, take a little butter, brown sugar, cinnamon, raisins, and then um, a half cup of water. And you would core the apples. So you take like a spoon or if you have a core, just core them out. And then you slit on them a little bit, just, um, you can do that so they don't um, burst open. Um, I've looked at other recipes also just, and you know, some of them don't have that and they, theirs turned out fine. So maybe you can skip that. Um, and then you can just put the different ingredients, kind of stuff it in there and put it in the slow cooker for about six to eight hours. And you can also do, you know, different things. You know, you can use things like granola, um, definitely cinnamon, and you can do it with sliced apples too and just adding kind of some seasonings. Um, some don't add water at all. Some use orange juice and all like, you know, um, can turn out excellent. So it's something about the slow cooker. It's just really forgiving that way, you know, and you're gonna learn, you know, I guess, which is kind of the fun about cooking. So also can be helpful for keeping foods warm. So things like mashed potatoes and oatmeal can be a great, um, great for the slow cooker. So I, one time I made a breakfast for some people at work and I was trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to do that with like oatmeal and things like that and eggs. And so using the slow cooker was awesome. Um, just keeping that food warm. All right. So lots of fun stuff. So handling leftovers safely. So you're like, well, I got everything, but uh, this can, there's some fun tips here too. So you want to handling leftovers to do it the safe way. So <laughs> I don't know how many people, you know, like you're just so tempted to just put that slow cooker insert just right in that fridge. Um, but really you remember in that danger zone, right? So the 40 to 140, you want to keep the food out of there as much as you can. So you want to transfer them to a shallow containers about two inches deep. So I worked in restaurants and you know, that is like the, gold standard you know once that soup if you have like the soup of the day you know it goes in like a, a, a thin pan to make it cool faster right and then refrigerating leftovers within two hours after they're like um from that heat of that slow cooker so they're safe for about two hours outside um without you know in the room whatever you know just just out there chilling in the room but just um you want to try to minimize that time as much as you can and you want to cool it quickly once you start to cool it so you know there's um yeah so it just can be important that way so refrigerating the leftovers just like we're talking about i guess um once they're removed from the heat so you know you could put it you know keep it in the slow cooker say if you didn't have a lot left you know you're like well it is a shallow pan there's only a little bit left in there but just remember to, you know, um, the actual slow cooker itself might be hot. So that would take a while for that to cool down. So just, I guess, thinking about that and really um, considering maybe putting it in a different pan. Okay. And then you don't want to reheat leftovers in your slow cooker either um, because they might not heat fast enough to be safe. Okay. So it just is taking too long for it to reach that safe temperature and the food already went through that once, you know, so you don't, so you don't want to do that again um, to it. Um, 
and then so like the thing about the slow cooker is it usually cooks for a long time you know at that temperature for several hours so the combination of that direct heat and the lengthy cooking and the steaming you know make it safe so then if you're just trying to like quickly reheat it um, it's not going to get there quite as fast okay and then so this is why just what we were talking about the 40 to 140 and so multiplies really a lot between that okay so reheating leftovers in the slow cooker of the microwave um, until it reaches eternal temperature 165 is what you'd want to do then and then um, putting them on okay so reheating leftovers so you can just once you reheat them out of the slow cooker you can put them in the slow cooker again and keep them on low or warm and then they'll be safe there okay so that's one of the advantages like how you could do mashed potatoes or oatmeal or something like that so just um for those of you um who have access to the chat box which of the statements here do you think is true then slow cookering works well for reheating leftovers slow cookers in the slow cooker insert in the in the <laughs> store leftovers in uh, insert in the refrigerator and re reheat leftovers in a microwave or on the stove for 165 and then transfer to slow heat. So you guys are all right, way to go. So definitely number three, so good job. So converting recipes for your slow cooker then. So here's how you would want to do it. If you have a recipe and you know, you don't have any slow cooker recipes, you don't really want to look it up, you have some tried and true favorites that you want to do. So using a recipe with ingredient amount similar if you can to existing slow cooker recipes and then just remembering you know like you're keeping that lid on and that is one key you know that that's why you don't need liquid is that they often um they don't boil away right whereas if you're having it on the stove you know the steam you know it's released and the liquids are often boiling away but in the slow cooker the lid is on so the liquids um stay more you know so you can often if you're doing recipes that are like, you know, transferring them to the slow cooker, you can usually reduce whatever the liquids are. Okay, that makes sense. And so obviously soup ones, you know, you're gonna have a lot of liquid anyway, so you could just use your tried and true soup recipe and just use it for the slow cooker then. And then remembering too, just um, even if you're doing things on the stove top, it's the same thing, but just you probably wanna add your pasta at the end of the cooking process if it's a long time cooking on that stove. Um, or in that slow cooker, um, just so that they don't get mushy. And so I was talking about working at that food kitchen again, but just one of the other things is, you know, we would serve the soup in slow cookers, but we'd keep the pasta for the soup separate. And so we'd refill the slow cookers with just a bunch of the soup, um, and then just add, you know, a scoop of the pasta that's been already cooked right and so just keeping those separate because you don't want the pasta to just keep cooking and cooking and cooking um same reason why you know lasagna you might want to stop at a certain point um and they'll still you know it there's nothing wrong with it for sure it just might have broken down a lot that's the same with fish too um you want to add them at the end because they don't take as long to cook and so like for example shrimp you put in the last 20 to 30 minutes of the dish so that is when you would list when you would lift the lid um and then some people have told me too that you know they don't like the green beans as much you know some people you know want things you know different textures and so green beans might be another one you'd add right at the end and things like herbs delicate herbs will get lost if you add them too early so adding those things at the end um, things like rosemary or something like that, bay leaves, they have a hardier kind of stem. Those can go on early, but the like things like basil or just even little bits of oregano, um, you know, cilantro for sure, things like that, they'd go in at the end because they're so delicate. Um, and then just, you know, keep, reminder, you know, if just because you can cook it for 10 or 11 hours doesn't mean that you should. So uh, one other thing that you'd want to add towards the end would be milk and cream. And there are some cheeses that work earlier. So um, you might have had that Velveeta cheese dip and things like that. So those you can add it earlier in the recipe. But just milk or cream you don't want to add too soon because um, it can start to curdle. 
So here, this will be in your handouts also, but just it's a time chart for adapting recipes. So if the recipe says, you know, it's only gonna take um, the middle one there 35 to 45 minutes to cook, um, it might take on high three to four hours. So that's how you can kind of figure it out then, okay? So one um, thing you can do is buy a programmable crock pot or you could get a timer. Um, and you could use one like um, the one you use with Christmas lights and those might be more expensive, less expensive, I mean, than getting, you know, maybe a different kind of timer. So you could set it up that way. Then you could set it to cook to exact time. And then a lot of the crock pots, though, they can go to low then, you know, um, starting at a certain time and then they would go to warm or low. Um, and so you can check with your slow cooker, see what it will do for you. And so just a couple other um, things here, no matter what anyone says, my cooking is excellent. Even the smoke alarm, you know, keeps cheering me on. So, and serving up a few final thoughts, you know, on home cooking then. It's cooking is not about being the best or the most perfect cook, but rather is about sharing the table with family and friends. So just, you know, kind of having fun with it and just enjoying the meal, you know, that's the, that's the key message here. And really trying to, you know, um, the slow cooker can allow you to eat more at home. You can tend to get healthier foods that way and more vegetables. Um, and then eating as a family has a lot of different benefits too for yourself and for um, if you have kids. So the kitchen really is a castle itself. This is where we spend our happiest moments and where we find the joy of being a family. And then some of the most important conversations I've ever had occurred at my family's dinner table. So I'll send you that evaluation again. So just um, after this webinar, and I really would appreciate your feedback if things um, you wanted different things addressed or just anything like that, I'd love to hear. And then I do have another class scheduled coming up and I'll be scheduling more, but just uh, snacking and eating out with diabetes. And this one will be great even if you don't have diabetes. So it's something anybody can do and that just um, some fun benefits uh, and the best of the best for snacking and eating out. So that one's on May 22nd. So it's a week and a day from now, so Friday. So just acknowledging, you know, um, some people helped with this Definitely do the handout. North Dakota State actually had some slides and then also um, some people here in Florida. And so I shared all their stories and put them together for this for you guys. So that's the end then. Um, and if, if anybody has any questions, I um, love to see in the chat box if you would like to learn anything more or if I might have wisdom from you or we could ask all the other people too. Um, I'm just reading through some of the comments here. Yeah, so Gail says, you know, if the Instapot can do the same as a slow cooker. Um, so the advantage, the difference I would say with the Instapot is that you can put frozen meats directly in the Instapot because it, you know, it's that temperature is almost instantly up. And so that's the thing about that one. Um, and then some Instapots do have the slow cooker option. So, um, and then, yeah, that's a good question. Denise asked to crock pot and slow cooker, same thing. So you're good, you're good on that. Um, yeah, yeah, and then Nancy writes crock pot, actual name. Okay, so why do eggs, ground meat, cook at a higher temperature than chuck meat? Okay, so things that are ground up, they have more opportunity to be exposed to the bacteria. Mm -hmm. So that's why they're um, why they need a higher uh, temperature to be food safe. Okay, so cuts of meat themselves are usually lower than whatever it is ground up. Okay, so let's see if there's anything else that I can help with. I like marinade pulled pork, excellent. Gail, Gail, um, I've actually had her split pea soup and it's excellent. So that is a really good one. The slow cooker. Okay, well, I will send you guys um, some recipes and um, yeah, the handouts that will be, I will send those to you. Um, all right. If anybody has any questions, let me see here.
You answered all our questions in the chat. Yeah, you guys did pretty well. Um, so you're emailing the handouts then? Yep, I'll email the handouts. I had a question, Mike. Yeah. Uh, uh, what can't you do with an Instapot that you can do with a slow cooker? Or does this Instapot do everything that the slow cooker does and more? So the Instapot usually has a slow cooker option, you know, okay. so you can um, do it the low and slow. Um, but I would love to hear, I guess, from anybody who has uh, Instapot if they have any other tips from that. Um, so obviously if the Instapot has a slow cooker option, I guess that would be, um, yes, you could you know do everything. But if there's anything um, that would make the slow cooker unique, I'm trying to think, might be less expensive. <laughs> I don't know, Mike, did that help you very much? Oh, yes, for sure. It was very helpful. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. the whole whole presentation. I got here late, but uh, it was thank enjoyable you. what thank I saw. Thank you for joining. And thank you, everybody. So I will, yes, I will email you the handouts. And if you have time to do the survey, I would love that also. So thank you all for your time. And hopefully I'll see you next week. Where do we see the survey? I, um, I actually, I'll just email you that link. Okay. Very good. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. You too.